Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. As Gisela just said, we just had a little bit of technical problems. We'll hope that the presentation is okay for now. So first of all, I'm Aurea Cuadros Pinal and I'm a board member of We Are Europe Barcelona. And I want to welcome you to a new Women for a Space conference. And many thanks to our speaker of today, Lucy Poulet. Before starting, I would like to introduce you a new project from We Are Barcelona. And the project consists in a mentoring program. On November 11th, we will do a presentation of this program. So if you are interested in participating in it or you just want to discover a little bit more on what's about, we encourage you to attend this presentation and the event. And you can be also in our social media networks to discover more about this mentoring pro program. To summarize the program, it will consist um, in forming pairs of groups between mentors with extensive uh, work experience and students that want to learn from them. On the other hand, I would like to already to let you know that in November, we will have another Women for Space conference with Playa Rivers as a speaker. And without further delay, now I want to introduce our speaker of today, Lucy Poulet. She's a postdoctoral researcher at NASA in the Kennedy Space Center, and she's part of the Spacecraft Production Group. Moreover, she has been working in bioregenerative life support related projects for over 10 years in different companies, such as DLR, SS, or ESA. And she holds a PhD in process engineering from University clermont Auvergne in France. As you all may know, on today's talk, Lucy will explain us a little bit more about her career, how plants will be the key element for future human spaceflight missions, and about the preparation of three parabolic flights scheduled for this fall. If you have any questions, you can write them in the chat during the presentation, and we will manage them after the talk. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Lucy, the floor is all yours. Hi, thank you so much for this introduction. Um, all right, you can hear me, you can see my screen. Are we good? Yeah, everything. Okay. Perfect. Okay, awesome. So I'll be starting. I'm sorry, I can't have it in full screen because I haven't figured out with a single monitor to have both um, Zoom and the full screen. So this is a bit embarrassing, but that's how it is today. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, talk about how we can use parabolic slides to uh, have uh, to have experiments related to growing plants in space. I currently work in the space crop production group at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I'm a postdoc there. I've been here there for uh, almost two years now. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's start. I'm really happy to be talking to you today. And yeah. Um, I'm starting with explaining why uh, why we need plants and uh, perhaps some people here, well, I know at least one person here um, is convinced about um, uh, why uh, plants will be important for future space missions. Uh, but what uh, I want to emphasize here with this slide is that currently we have we are we have veggie and the advanced plant habitat on the International Space Station. Um, so veggie is the two top photos and IPH is the two bottom photos. And these systems enable plant growth uh, on the ISS, um, but in small volume, small quantities. Veggie, we can, we have two units, so we can grow six plants per unit. And APH um, is also a, a smaller unit. So the, the, the systems we have right now are really designed for, well, veggie, uh, demonstration of uh, crop production in, in space. And APH is more for but fundamental uh, plant biology experiment in the uh, zero G laboratory that, that is the ISS. Um, we, so we have only small quantities and to emphasize, oops, to emphasize that, um, I'm showing you here a, um, the results of a harvest uh, of veggie um, after um, um, after one of the experiments harvest, this is what's remaining for the crew because half of it is frozen for later analysis. Um, so this is what they have. So right now, plants are not even a you know a supplemental food for astronauts. It's really a bonus food when when they have some. Well, they are happy to enjoy a leaf or a radish or whatever from time to time. But 
um, not not really um, it's not really included in their diet. Their diet is composed of prepackaged food, as uh, most of you know here. Uh, the problem of prepackaged food, I mean, it's really practical for uh, the International Space Station. You can resupply it quite easily um, because the International Space Station is not far. Uh, the problem of, um, of prepackaged food is that after a number of years, vitamins tend to degrade after three years, for example. So um, if you plan a long duration mission to Mars, for example, um, you'll have problems of, um, of vitamins being really reduced in your food. So that's, that's not uh, ideal for the crew. And so that's why we want to, to have plants that can supply vitamins. And the other important fact about plants is that um, thanks to photosynthesis, they, um, they can uh, recycle the air we can recycle water, and we can include them in a bioregenerative life support system to uh, treat waste. And this way, we can have circular systems, closed loops, where um, we can uh, produce food, we can recycle water, recycle the air, and treat waste um, of the crew with uh, biological elements and plants are, are some of them. Um, so the, the goal, what we envision for, for this as, um, as being, you know, the space crop production group, what, what we have in mind for uh, microgravity or Mars, for example, that these two artists view with uh, large scale production systems um, lo looking like greenhouses, um, but on different planets or in a spacecraft. Um, where we have people that can interact with plants, but also robots that uh, take care of a lot of tasks that the humans would not have time necessarily to, um, to do. And where we have a diversity of crop that can sustain uh, a human diet for many years. So this is really the vision. Uh, and I'm going to uh, tell you now what we do in our group to uh, work towards this vision this long-term vision. I mean, that's the vision, you know, very long-term vision. And um, we have, uh, in our group, we are really a diverse team because we have, uh, of course, plant physiologists who are working with us, uh, but we also need engineers, we need chemists, we need microbiologists, we need um, technicians that will make the, uh, uh, the lab run as well. And uh, all of these uh, people really work together for, to, for one goal, which is enabling uh, crop growth in space. And uh, some of our activity involves operations uh, because, well, as I said, we have veggie and the advanced plant habitat on the International Space Station. And these two systems, uh, they, need, they need support from the ground. And this is what we, we do. Um, so for example, here you have Peggy Whitson, um, who was about to, to do a harvest on veggie on the ISS. And so while Peggy Whitson does that, we have our team on the ground um, monitoring what Peggy Whitson or any other astronaut is doing on veggie. And we follow that live and we can give advice to the astronauts or guide them or uh, ask for more precisions on some of the actions so um, th I mean, this is really interesting, and um, it's a great way uh, to have a, an idea of how the, the plants look like after uh, their period of growth there. Um, we, so along with this operational support, we also have to prepare the flight experiment. And as you may know, uh, we, we try to not not ship any, or we try to ship as few microorganisms as possible to the International Space Station. So uh, everything we prepare for the plant growth experiment is under a hood. And uh, you see people who are in handling the, the growth media, they all wear gloves um, and uh, everything, like the seeds are disinfected. Uh, we have a protocol for that so that we don't kill them. 
Uh, but yeah, it's very uh, flight experiments preparation is um, is very uh, rigorous in terms of sanitation. Um, we have ground control experiments as well because uh, when we have experiments on the International Space Station, we mimic exactly all the same conditions. So we do that maybe 48 hours later or 36 hours later, depending um, on the schedule, but we mimic the exact same conditions as the ISS on the ground. And the only variable is really gravity. So we have, the, we have two, two veggie units, um, and we have more veggie units than that on the ground, but we can have two veggie units working in parallel that we put in a growth chamber. And we have uh, sensors from the ISS sending us um, uh, you know, the relative humidity, the temperature, the CO2 level every, um, um, every five minutes. And then we, we have this information and so 48 hours later, we reproduce that in our growth chamber. And then we can um, have the exact same operations that the astronauts are doing. Like on the left, uh, you see my colleague, Jeff Bunsek, who is watering veggie. Um, and she's basically following the same order in plants that the astronauts did. Um, and uh, yeah, trying to spend it the same amount of time as they did as well. And on the right side, I'm cutting some leaves and uh, removing, removing the same amount of, of, uh, of plant as the astronauts did. Uh, that was an experiment with, that we call um, cut and come again. So we cut some leaves and then a few uh, days later, we come back for four more. Um, that's a good way of having fresh supplies all the time without having to grow plants uh, from seed to full maturity over time. Um, we, of course, we also looked into uh, uh, developing easy seed handling because um, seeds are tiny and in microgravity, this could be really problematic with seeds flying all over. So um, our team came up with a seed film which dissolves in water. So you have the seeds that are um, uh, trapped in this field so we can handle them easily um, in microgravity. And then when we plant them, uh, it's dissolved and the, the seeds can just germinate uh, as usual. Um, we test also, and that's more part of the research um, that we do. Uh, so what I talked about earlier is research, but oriented operations. And now it's more uh, fundamental research and applied research. The seed film is part of this research and innovation. Here we have um, a photo of the different species we've been testing in our in our group um, to find the um, um, the species that would work best in space conditions. So we reproduce conditions at the International Space Station that is really high CO2 level, 3,000 ppm, uh, two to 3,000 ppm. On Earth right now we have we we are at 400, so it's really a lot. And we um, we test with different lighting and different watering conditions and things like that. And we try to um, take the uh, choose the plants that are resistant and resistant and doing well, striving in this environment. We collaborate for that with uh, a network of schools in the U.S. It started in Florida, and now it's uh, the whole country. Uh, and schools actually help us choosing this plant because they grow a number of species in their classroom and then uh, they collect data and we have a statistician looking at all this data and thanks to this project, uh, they already chose um, Pactroid, one of the, uh, of the species to, to grow for um, to future long duration missions. So among these uh, new crops, we and you probably heard of that. We ha we are growing peppers right now uh, in the advanced plant habitat. So this was this um, was tweeted by Thomas Pasque, who is currently on the International Space Station, and um, he had just taken care of the of the of the chilies uh, on that day um, and chili peppers on that day. And um, basically, um, the astronauts had to. Uh, uh, pollinate the, the, 
those plants by hand uh, to make sure uh, pollination was uh, well done. So we had a system of ventilation inside the, the box to move the, the, the flowers. But as a precautionary measure, we also had the astronauts coming in and um, rubbing their finger in the, in the flowers to make sure we have pollination. Right now we have peppers growing uh, in the in the International Space Station, and that's the first fruit growing in uh, low Earth orbit. So we are really happy with that. Um, and yeah, chili pepper. Um, that's one of the species we've been investigating in our lab. Um, before these experiments, they've been there have been maybe two or three years of studies just on that, growing a lot of peppers in the lab, uh, studying all the conditions, um, having a light recipe that will make the, uh, the 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 plant small enough to fit um, the the space systems that are smaller and need a smaller volume. So yeah, because these uh, Espanola peppers in the wild they are much bigger, but we have a light recipe that enables them to to stay small. So a lot of things like that preparatory work was done in our lab uh, to enable this experiment. Um, so yeah, growing plants in space is not trivial, and uh, there are many, many things uh, that we need to, um, many, many challenges that, that are ahead of us. Uh, so we have uh, problems with insufficient root um, and water in the root zone. Like here, we have a seedling that's dried, um, and we, we also have problems of excess water. That's a photo of the veggie system that is closed, and there is a lot of condensation inside. Um, these things happen also because of the um, uh, the lack of buoyancy-driven convection in uh, in microgravity. So, because of that, uh, air and water don't behave the same way, uh, especially on the roof. Uh, water, um, if there is well, if there is too much water in a with a media that is not adapted, you will drown your roof and they will be unable to, to breathe and then the, 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 the plants will die. If you have um, a, a media that will not let water circulate as, as it should, then the, the roots will dry. And that's what we were seeing on the previous photo. Um, if you don't have enough uh, airflow inside the, the chamber, you'll have problems of high humidity and then some um, fungi which will develop. This is usually uh, when you have high humidity uh, and low airflow conditions, uh, you have opportunistic microbial and fungal growth happening. And this is what happened in, uh, in veggie uh, with the zinnias, the flowers, um, because of a, of a fan problem. Um, so too much moisture and this is, this, this is what happened. Um, so, along that, um, that along that uh, topic, uh, my uh, focus during my my postdoc here was to look at the interaction between ventilation and photosynthesis uh, for plants in reduced gravity environments. So, basically, because there is no buoyancy-driven convection, there is no natural mixing. So. Um, or you have two options, or you do nothing, and then your plants won't grow as well as they do on Earth. Or you add a fan, and then that's artificial mixing, and you can um, you can have adequate photosynthesis. And this is really the method that's been used for decades uh, on the ISS. However, um, the uh, amount of ventilation of airflow that you need has not really been quantified, and so we may be wasting a lot of energy. Uh, and this becomes important for larger scale uh, systems. Um, the system you see here on this photo is a, a small scale system. You have only one plant that can fit in this box. And this box is linked to a gas analyzer, an infrared gas analyzer, uh, which is um, measuring how much CO2 has been used by the plant and how much water has been released, so transpiration. Um, and these uh, give me data on um, on how photo, how efficient the photosynthesis is with different ventilation. There are different fans inside the this chamber that I can uh, 
vary and tune so that um, it, uh, it changes uh, the photosynthesis rate. And uh, this is used to feed a model. Uh, and then with this model, we can infer, infer what's going on in uh, reduced gravity. I'll detail this uh, in a few slides. So when you study gas exchange in, in space, you, you, can, uh, you can do it at uh, three different um, scales. You can do it at the time, or three different time scales. Either um, you look at it in seconds or in the frame of minutes or in the frame of days. And um, when you do that, um, it will change the type of things you are looking at. Um, it, it can be um, something, a dynamic physical response, or it can be a steady state biological response, or then it can be biomass production, and then you have growth response of your, of your plant. And the, the system I just, just described is a system that is looking at what's happening in steady states, because we are looking at what happens on the plant in the frame of minutes. And so we're really looking at biological response and we can measure leaf temperature and gas exchange. Um, this is uh, what do we do with this system. So to um, come back to the model I just mentioned two slides earlier, uh, usually uh, these have some animation, so it's a little bit less formulas all at, all at once, but uh, today I don't have these animations because I'm not uh, with the uh, the presentation mode. So I'm sorry, you have a lot of uh, information all at once. So I'll, I'll, I'll go slowly. Uh, we start with the mass balance. That's the top part. Um, so to model gas exchange in plants and plant growth, we start with looking at what's happening in terms of flux exchanges, like what mass flux exchanges. And these are linked to CO2 absorption, water transpiration, and oxygen release. And these, these fluxes, that's the, the first formula, uh, the top formula you see here, uh, they are linked to um, the gradient of partial pressure. And you may be able to see my mouth right now. So it's the uh, gradient of partial pressure that's driving the uh, magnitude of these exchanges. And, uh, we have here uh, the constant here, which is dependent on the band relayer delta, band relayer thickness delta. And this band relayer is dependent on the gravity, um, the gravity parameter and the force convection parameter value. Um, these uh, band relayer thickness is basically uh, a, a a layer of stagnant air, um, if I explain it uh, very, um, uh, very, very high level. So it's, it's going to be a, a layer of stagnant air forming around the leaf when you are, have an airflow. So um, these uh, thickness will depend on how much forced airflow is um, applied and what is the, the gravity parameter. Then you look at the energy balance, that's the second part of the slide, the bottom part, and um, we looked at the different energies that are uh, incoming and exiting the, the plant. And so we have energy coming from the light, we have radiation energy, we have convection energy that, that's uh, either coming or exiting the, the plant, and we have transpiration energy. And so these helps us uh, enables us to link the temperature of the leaf to the transpiration rate, to the incidence light, to the amount of water in the, in the leaf, and to uh, these boundary layer thickness. And this is really interesting because it enables us to study gas exchange looking at the leaf temperature. And we can do that in smaller time frames. And I come back to this slide. When we are studying gas exchange in a smaller time frame, the parameter we, we can look at is the leaf temperature. And what we will be studying in that case, of course, is a physical response, not a biological response from 
from a plant because the time scale is too small for that. But we can study that in a pair of slides. And this is what we did with my group, uh, my former group, and um, that was uh, uh, three years ago, well, four, three and four years ago. Uh, and we, uh, we, 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 were, we were with Novus Pass, so that was in Europe, uh, when I was at University of Tom uh, during my PhD. And so we participated in uh, one parabolic flight campaign with CNES and, one, and two with uh, ESA. And I'm just uh, putting this slide here uh, to remind everyone uh, of what is a parabolic flight. So we have a, a plane that's uh, uh, starting uh, uh, in horizontal flight, <clears throat> steady horizontal flight. And then the plane is... Uh, um, per, um, inclining at 47 degrees and you have a hypergravity phase that's usually 2G and then the plane is in free fall. When the plane is in free fall, everybody inside is also in free fall, free fall and the experiments as well. And then the plane recovers and you have the 2G uh, phase and back to steady, steady flight. And we do that uh, 30 times. So this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, oops, sorry. Oh yeah, of course, I don't have the um, animation. So I'm just going to uh, move this. I hope that's fine with you. So this is um, one parabola. So 2G, we go to 0G and we go back to 2G. That's basically what our actual accelerometer was measuring. And if you look at the whole, if you look at the whole flight, it looks like this. You have uh, 31 parabolas. We have one extra parabola to try things on. But yeah, the, that's the, uh, um, the, the the gravitational acceleration, so gravity around uh, along the, the, the whole duration of the flight. So this is what happens. We have packs of five parabolas, six of them, and, um, and it's two, for two hours like this. Um, so when we, we looked at our model and did some, uh, a lot of simulation with the model and uh, with different parameters and did some statistics on, on that, we found that when we look at the leaf temperature of a plant, it is indeed significantly different in 0G compared to 1G and 2G. And 1G and 2G, they look... Uh, pretty uh, similar. I mean, the, they're, 1G is a bit warmer, but they are not statistically uh, different, different. And you can see that experimentally as well. Um, we will start with the right picture here. This was not taken during our flight. It was taken 20 years ago uh, by a, a Japanese team, of, uh, Professor Kitaya. And what you see here is um, a barley leaf, uh, a sweet potato leaf, sorry. And you have um, the leaf here in 1G, the temperature is not moving. But when you go to the hypergravity phase, you see that the leaf is cooling down slowly. And you go to uh, the, the zero G phase, um, and the, the leaf is warming up. And then back to a hypergravity phase, and the leaf is cooling down. So this is what uh, experimentally you can observe. Now on the left side, this is our um, a photo from the campaigns that were I was uh, talking earlier uh, with Nova Fast and Isa and Knef. And we were looking at spinach leaves and have the experimental setup right after so you can see that. And these leaves was covered with nail polish, so it was not transpiring. And this one was not covered, so it was transpiring. And what you see on this photo is that the non-transpiring leaf is way warmer than the one that can transpire. So these uh, shows the link between the temperature and transpiration. It, it shows it experimentally, and this is what the equation uh, I presented before um, was showing, that there is a link. Um, that's our experimental setup. So the whole setup here on the bottom photo installed in the plane and the spinach inside there are little uh, apparatus uh, for 
being tested. So the leaves were laid flat so that we could take infrared photos of the of the leaves during the flight. Now I'm switching topic here, so it seems like it's not linked, but you'll see why it is linked. <laughs> um, I just talked about how we use the parabolic flight to um, to to look at gas exchange, right? Um, but then we have um, we have another another topic uh, that's growing in in the in the base crop production group, uh, and this is microgreens. So we even have we have a, a post a postdoc, another postdoc working on microgreens, and um, she did the this slide, Christina Johnson. She she made it. And what um, this tells us is that microgreens are really a really good space crop candidate because with uh, one gram of seeds, you can yield the 76 gram of edible biomass and on only 40 um, square centimeters. So this is this is really good. And microgreens are also very uh, nutrients because they are small plants. So all the nutrients of the seeds are contained there. So they're very interested, interesting for supplemental food. And I was, we were discussing with Christina and we thought, okay, we have microgreens. Um, it would be really interesting to, even though they are small plants, they are so densely sown that it would be interesting to look at their photosynthesis rate. But I can't, like, photosynthesis is due to absorption, but it's also water transpiration. And I cannot look at water transpiration if everything is in this setup here. So the setup on the left, that's uh, how microgreens are, are grown for earth uh, applications. So if you go to the market, you may be able to, to find microgreens, and this is how they're grown. In this case, I cannot measure transpiration because there is no separation between the, the aerial part of the plant and the media. So what I would be measuring is evaporation from the media and transpiration of the plant. This is not something I can do. So I was uh, looking, I was, we were, you know, brainstorming on, on a, a way to design a system that would allow me to um, grow microgreens and separate the, the root zone from the aerial part. And so our team came up with this design where we have uh, one hole for seed and the, the microgreens grow like this. So from the top part, to the top view, it looks like it looks like this. We still have a, a canopy of microgreens, but now I know that when I measure um, when I put this box with my, of microgreens in my measuring chamber, I know that what I, I am measuring is the transpiration from the canopy and not the evaporation from the media. But we also recognize something with, um, with this um, system. So this is the lid of our system. We notice that we can harvest microgreens way more easily in space with uh, a box like this. The reason for that is, is that these lids enable really a full separation between the roots and what you are going to eat. And you don't want to be eating roots um, because it's full of microbes and especially in space, I already said that, we really want to limit the amount of um, microbial loads on the plants and on the food of the astronaut. Uh, so Growing microgreens, like I showed in the previous slide, like this, this would not be really an option. Um, so our system here enables to a clean harvest without root contamination. So we thought, okay, this would be really, really interesting to harvest in um, in geology. However, if we don't come up with uh, harvesting techniques and bagging techniques, um, if we just take scissors and a bag next to the astronauts, when they cut the microgreens, it just doesn't fly everywhere in the station. So we need to find something. So uh, we, we applied for funding and we got funded to test the systems in uh, parabolic flight, in three parabolic flights that are coming in November and December of this year. And here you have uh, one example of one of the cutting techniques we have. It's 
kind of, it's a, we call it the guillotine. It's basically a blade that's going all the way and cutting them. And the bag you see here is what we are putting on top of our, pro, of, a, of our plant units to secure microgreens uh, when we harvest them and so that they don't fly away everywhere. So we have different techniques like those for bagging and for cutting. I'm not presenting it all here because it's, uh, it's a presentation in itself. But we'll be using a glove box. That's the glove box that is here. It's uh, loaned to us by the, by the University of Louisville. Uh, our collaborator is Professor George Gonzalez. And this is the inside of the glove box uh, when we were uh, training on it. So we will have all of our plant units inside the glove box and we will um, be testing all of our harvesting units. And this time with zero gene of this Nova staff because we are in the US, so this is their plane. Um, and that's, yeah, that's just uh, the, the difference between the two, the, these two parabolic places. The, the provider is different and the, the place is different as well. And yes, um, this is all for me to say. So if you have questions, I'll be really happy to answer. Um, thank you so much for your attention. I um, hope, uh, okay, we still have time, that's nice. Thank you very much, Lucy. It was uh, really interesting to hear, to see so uh, much uh, current research, uh, things that are happening right now and that are about to happen. It's great. Uh, we have uh, some people in the audience. If you want to ask questions, uh, please feel free to use the chat and, and write them on and we'll go through them. I will start uh, to give some time to people to, to type the questions. Um, I've been working in a quite crazy project thinking about the future city on Mars. And uh, we would like to imagine that there would be a lot of green areas in there uh, but you mentioned one of the problems that might occur on that, the, the pollinization of the plants and, and how that you're making sure that the astronauts uh, take, take care of part of it. So uh, I guess we, we don't value that much the insects, the bees that we have around us. Should we imagine something like that on Mars or are you also trying to focus on that problem on your research or some of your colleagues? Well, I, I, well so yeah, personally, I don't, but... Uh... We, I know that I think some groups have been focusing on, on you know, pollination. Uh, in our group right now, I'm not aware of a project that's really focused just on that. But um, what, okay, here are what I, what I know about bees and insects that could be a problem uh, on other planets and in space. It's First, their orientation. They orient themselves with the sun in the magnetic field, if I'm not mistaken. So that could be a problem on Mars. Uh, and they, uh, and then if you are in microgravity, then I don't think I don't know how they can fly. Like, I, I mean, birds have a lot of trouble flying. They actually can't really fly in microgravity. So I don't know about insects. Um, so that's the limitation for, for them. Then if you bring insects, they have to be really well contained because otherwise you may have a, a problem. Um, and then I know that robotic bees have been studied. So that could be uh, an option maybe. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's my take on, uh, on insects. But for sure, uh, hand pollination, if you have a large surface, would not be an option. Okay, thank you. I, I still don't see questions on the chat. I don't know if people are shy or you explain everything so well that, that uh, everything was well understood. So I'll just uh, keep going. Um, maybe not so much uh, focusing on the content, on the technical content, but um, how how did you come to do what you do? Uh, what what was uh, when you were a girl? Uh, you already knew which direction you would take that you would actually become an engineer, or how was it for an you? An engineer? No, I didn't know about the engineering part. Um, I basically I wanted to work in space. It was yeah, it's been my pa passion. Like yeah, it's wide. Space is wide, but it's really been a passion since uh, well, ever since I remember. Um, and, and I really started more on astronomy and really, you know, watching the sky and and going to astronomy clubs and 
um, things like that. Um, and my first wish was more astrophysicist than an uh, engineer. Uh, but then, yeah, um, I don't know, like orientation happened and uh, um, yeah, I became an engineer because I also, that's also something um, I, I like, you know, like uh, understanding things and building things. And then later a researcher because um, I discovered I, when I did my first engineering degree, I thought I would never become a researcher because I thought that was, you know, I, I will not say boring because it's not boring, but I thought it was not main for, main, meant for me. I have only seen fundamental research and fundamental researchers and everything seems really abstract. And then during my master's degree, I did a master's thesis and I was working in a lab and I discovered applied research and I thought, well, this is really something I like. And all of that was linked to space, of course. Uh, it was even linked to plants in space. So um, I really enjoyed it. And that's when I decided to, to go for a PhD and, and orient my career more towards research and not just uh, engineering. I mean, not just engineer, like, uh, like as a physician. Thank you. And do you think that at any of these stages, uh, anything would have been different or easier uh, being a man? Or has it made a difference uh, being a woman? Have you ever had the I feeling? I don't know. Actually, uh, I, I don't think um, I don't think it would have been easier if I had been a man. Uh, but um, I've, I've tried to seize any opportunity that was offered me or that happened you know I tried I tried many things and uh, yeah when there was an opportunity I was following it I was following the project uh, I thought when uh, you know like I want I really wanted to go for a master's in aerospace engineering I did that but it also means that I've been moving in different countries for the last you know 15 years um, and I had no strings attached like the children that would have um, um, prevented me from doing that. So I have, you know, like I did it in a time, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> I did it in a time of my life where um, I could do that without, uh, without any problem. And so I also think that's why it made no difference in that, uh, in that instance. Good, good to hear. A um, couple of questions more uh, from my side. Uh, how do you value the aerospace sector, uh, both looking at positive and, and negative things uh, and the impact that, that the aerospace sector has in, in our society? Um, how do, um, well, I think, and I can talk for, uh, for the field. I mean, uh, I think we are, we are having a positive impact because, um, we are really looking into recycling and circularity. And this is uh, how we are focusing our, our way of thinking uh, when we are trying to develop a, um, uh, like a food system or a life support system for the astronauts. Uh, we are in such a constrained environment um, that it, make, it, made, it, sorry, it makes us think outside of the box and forces us to find innovative, innovative solutions. And then these solutions, we can apply them uh, on Earth in a wide range of areas. Um, you can apply it for water recycling, for um, new ways of growing food, um, for, um, for uh, waste treatment. So um, in our field, really, um, I think the, the impact is that it's positive. And, and then for the aerospace in general, I think it's a, a great way to uh, inspire people and uh, yeah, keep the dream alive. Uh, I think uh, as humans, when we look at the sky, it's hard to stay indifferent. And, uh, and yeah, the aerospace uh, sector is reminding us that you know, they, there is something there to explore and we have astronauts you know, we have a, a station that's been inhabited um, for decades now, and we have astronauts circling the Earth. Um, 
all the all the time. So I don't know. It's a, I think that just that is a great reminder of um, everything we we can explore, and it's inspiring. Yeah, it is. It is a great inspiration. Uh, and maybe that links to the last question. Uh, which message would you like to transmit to the new generations to come? It's quite a new wide question. Um, well, well, I could have a message of if they want to follow, um, you know, what if they want to find their path or do what they want, uh, I would say just, uh, yeah, if you have a passion, follow it and uh, work hard towards it because um, if you have a dream, um, it wouldn't be a dream if it was easy to reach. So work hard and ask for help when you need it because you will need help and sometimes it's hard to realize that uh, you need to ask for it, but don't hesitate and ask and go knock on the door of seniors in your field. Um, yeah, and then for a more general message, uh, yeah, just uh, think about the impact of your field when you when you start working in it. I mean, impact on the planet. Like, is it something you want to be working in, and are you proud to be in this sector? I think it's important as well. Thank you, thank you. I think those were very good words to conclude uh, today's talk. Uh, there are, I think, no questions on the chat, but. Uh, uh, then I'll just conclude uh, thanking you for the, the presentation and uh, thank you the people on the audience. I think people are already leaving, but uh, thank you all for being there today. And once again, thank you, Lucy, for explaining us, uh, getting us closer to your work and good luck with uh, those parabolic flights uh, coming soon. Well, I'm, I'm quite jealous, I have to admit. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> Good luck with those. And uh, with that, uh, we'll conclude uh, today's talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.